Hello? Hello. Did it? <laughs> yes. I, sorry, I don't know why it was not working. Uh, okay. I was just like, um, um, okay, let us uh, start, Bernard, because we have the people already connected. Okay. And, uh, uh, welcome to our imaging talks. Uh, here with me is Covadonga, which is the uh, head of the imaging uh, here at Ramon y Cajal. And uh, our imaging talks is, is quite a, a chat with all the, the attendees. And we want just yes, to cover today the calcification of the uh, imaging the aortic calcification. Why it's important and, uh, and um, how to proceed with these patients. So, Cova, it's now your turn if you want to start with a chat with Bernard. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Bernard, for accepting our invitation. It's our great, great pleasure to have you here. And so I will just give you some uh, minutes to introduce um, the topic and, and answer the, the question we posed, why is it so important to assess uh, aortic valve calcification? And then maybe we can start with some questions from the, from the, from the audience and, and even ourselves. Okay, with pleasure. So thank you for the invitation and uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, I don't know what's happened, but okay, now it's solved. So uh, why is the calcification of the aortic valve important in the assessment of aortic stenosis? First, we know that uh, the calcification uh, has a diagnostic value. Uh, we know that in the guidelines, for example, for the low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis, especially when there are discordant values, we have, uh, of course, uh, to use the calcium score using essentially uh, the uh, CT. And we have two types of values for women and for men. So uh, this is something that will uh, allow us to go for the diagnosis of a true aortic stenosis. Calcification of the aortic valve is also important regarding the prognostic value, uh, first in native valves, uh, because as you may know, uh, there are some old publications showing that uh, independent of the severity of the aortic stenosis, so the uh, amount of calcium in this native valve will predict the uh, free even survival in these patients and also the rate of progression. And maybe we can talk also about the presence of microcalcification in these valves, so in an earlier stage, for example, of patients with sclerosis of the aortic valve, which is somewhere already a form of uh, aortic stenosis. It's also important, of course, in patients with uh, prostasis, uh, and also before, for example, TAVR, we know that the amount of calcium and the localization of the calcium will predict the outcome of these patients in terms of paravalvular leak or in terms of uh, to require uh, base. And of course, for the, the prosthetic uh, degeneration or uh, disease, uh, calcification is of course a sign that you not neglect. Uh, two other important fields where the calcium in, in this setting is important is the prevention. We are working hard to find some mechanism to some risk factors and some treatment um, in, in these patients because actually when we are acting at the later stage when the valve is heavily calcified there is only one option is surgery of TAVR. And the last point is the treatment. I think we actually also uh, looking for non-surgical treatment so alternative treatment in these patients uh, having high, highly calcified uh, aortic stenosis. There are some uh, investigations regarding the use of lithotripsy, for example, or surgical decalcification instead of a plasty. So that's a big picture about the role of calcification of the aortic valve. And I propose now to make it uh, a debate or a discussion with the attendees. Um, and Bernard, thank you for this introduction. It's really, really a pleasure. Uh, to have you with us in this uh, last uh, chat before summer. And my question uh, for you is, well, and, and to best evaluate the calcification, uh, do we need more than 3D echo? Do we need CT? What do you think? So actually the, the gold standard is uh, the CT. 
So actually, we, we are looking at the aortic valve calcium score. Uh, actually, we use most of the time an ECG-gated uh, CT in axial scans, and we express the uh, volume and the radio density as the uh, Agatston units. So that's actually the gold standard. But there are some several limitations to that. So of course, we have to take into account the size of the aorta uh, and of the annulus, because if, for example, a very small annulus, a very small valve, and you have a lot of calcium, so the density of calcium is not the same. That's for first. Second, we know that there are some gender differences. Uh, and that's why we have two different cutoffs in the guidelines. So it's 1,200 for women and it's 2,000 for the men. And this is also underlined some kind of limitations of this technique with the CT. Uh, and, and this is because there is a gender difference in the mechanism of aortic stenosis in women and in men, we can discuss that further on. Ourselves, we have been working on other techniques like echocardiography, and we have conducted some uh, uh, in vivo and ex vivo experimentations uh, using echo. So first we have been using the backscatter, and then we have moved to the uh, grayscale imaging. And uh, the advantage of ECHO, of course, is that you can repeat the examination. There is no radiation problem. The uh, limitations that you need to have good quality imaging. We are working actually on software to automatize the, uh, uh, the calcification amount at that level. And we are now moving to 3D. And, but actually, we use only uh, transophageal ECHO because of the required quality imaging. So it's also possible to use uh, so echocardiography to do that. We have validated that in patients with moderate to uh, severe aortic stenosis against CT, but also against the weight of the valves. And uh, another group in France, in Créteil, have done the same, and we have concordant results with different machines. So we are using actually uh, uh, GE, and we are moving to Philips also to validate uh, this. And we, we work with the Philips team in Paris in order to make it more automatic and to be uh, suitable for the uh, uh, for the, uh, the clinical practice. And at the end, what we can also use, but it's still uh, an experimental, I think, examination, is the PET CT. And maybe we can discuss this further on in order to, to allow other questions. I hope this answers to your question. Yeah. Koba, uh, do you have a question there? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, uh, the possibility to, to assess calcification with ultrasound is really appealing because it's something we have on hand and uh, we can do ourselves because I know what the guidelines say, it says about uh, low flow, low gradient, or even when you have doubts on aortic uh, stenosis severity and, and we should go for CT scan. Uh, but there are a lot of places, a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, of cities and, and labs where we perform uh, T echocardiography. I don't know what is your, your opinion on that. Uh, we don't perform that much calcium CT in order to define the aortic stenosis severity, probably because it's more easy for us uh, just to perform a TE with 3D planimetry of the aortic valve. So uh, I would like a comment uh, on that uh, from you and also uh, linking with what you were saying, that would be very, we have two in one. I mean, if we get to assess the calcium with ultrasound and assess uh, aortic valve area planimetry with 3D images, we can do uh, both, uh, both uh, measurements in the echo lab and, and we don't have, uh, at least for us, Sometimes it's complicated to, to get a CT scan uh, as, as soon as we would like. Yeah, I can only agree with that. So, you know, I'm an echocardiographist, basically. So, uh, of course, uh, that's why we initiate these findings, because it seems so obvious that you can have, let's, let's say, at least a rough evaluation of the calcium amount of the, at the level of the aortic valve with transophageal echo, at least. Uh, but um, of course, the problem is always the repeatability and, um, 
and also the variability of the measurements. You can still have go for a semi-quantitative evaluation and say it's heavily calcified, it can only be a true stenosis. Actually, we move to CT mainly when we have a doubt about the measurements. Uh, so in, in the case of discordant values, as I mentioned earlier, but we don't, we don't move systematically to CT. Of course, no more and more patients may beneficiate from TAVR. And in this particular case, because of the need for uh, having some, some specific dimensions, we are doing both in this population. So we are doing a transvaginal echo and CT for the measurements. On top of that, the CT can also be very useful for the assessment of the vessels. And uh, therefore we, we proceed systematically in this particular population to both examinations. Otherwise, and, and here we are only speaking about the heavily calcified aortic stenosis that are severe, but the aim is really to be able to have a technique uh, that we can validate in this population of severe aortic stenosis, but to have a technique that we can use in more, in, in less severe, sorry, in less severe aortic stenosis. Why? Because if you want to look at the effect of the treatment of a drug, for example, on the calcification development, you need to repeat the examination over time. And you cannot do that with CT because of the radiation problem. So we want to have really a scoring system, which is semi-automatic, reliable, uh, that is repeatable and strong in order to be able to repeat the examination as much as we want, not only with transophageal echo, but also with transthoracic echo. And I can develop that further on if you want, but I think it's very important because actually when you do I think the low flow, low gradient with discordant values, it's not a big amount of patients in our population of aortic stenosis. So the main aim of this technique for us is not just for a diagnostic, it's also for other things. And especially for, I think the prediction of the evolution of the, of the calcification of the stenosis for the prevention of, of aortic stenosis and also for the treatment of stenosis. Uh, Bernard, uh, but uh, taking into account the, the beauty of uh, ECHO is that you can repeat the exam in of the follow-up. One to follow I assume it's much more easy to do the follow-up with ECHO than with CT or even with PET. So what is the real correlation between the data that you have with your uh, Agaston score and, uh, with a CT versus the 3D ECHO, for example? So what we have, we have a correlation with a coefficient around uh, yeah, 0 0.6, so which is not bad. Uh, and I think we, we don't have that many outliers. So I think it's quite reliable. And we compare that not only to the CT, but also uh, with, the, uh, with the weight of the, of the valves. That, that are some things that we can do. And we have been doing that in patients before an aortic valve replacement. So we have this gold standard available. And then, so this correlation is quite good. So indeed, uh, it's quite encouraging, but the problem is to make it really automatic. So actually with the Philips, you can use the iSlice system and you, you can extract all the slice um, uh, and to analyze all the slides and then to accumulate them in order to calculate the volume, exactly what the CT guys are doing. So, and it, it improves the correlation with the CT even. So I think that that's a very promising technique, but we still need to have some support from the companies in order to make it automatic and reliable. Another drawbacks of the echo is of course that one patient is not another one. And so, you need to have some control about the surrounding areas with the blood pool, with the tissue in order to correct the value that you obtained uh, on your grayscale imaging uh, to, in order to have something very standardized, which is not the case with CT. So it complicates a little bit, I think, the uh, analysis of the images uh, with echo, but I think if we can automatize that, it will be uh, 
I think quite uh, quite interesting because we can do we can do a one stop shop using Echo instead of uh, going from one one to another uh, machines and it remains I think uh, in the hand of cardiologists and so you do not depending on radiologists for example and I think it's a good thing regarding at least the availability. And we have here a question from Ignacio Iglesias. What is, in your opinion, Bernard, of the utility of the aortic calcium score in non-degenerative aortic valve disease, for example, by cuspid valve? That's, that's a very good point. Uh, in fact, as you may know, so this predictive value uh, regarding, um, regarding the, the, aortic, the calcification in aortic stenosis uh, has been studied uh, many years ago by Rafael Rosenek with ECHO and with Messica Zetun in France uh, with CT. And I have shown that in fact, these calcification are indeed independent predictor of the uh, even free survival in severe and moderate aortic stenosis. But more recent studies has been looking at two other populations. So I'm briefly mentioned men versus women, but there are also some studies regarding the patients with bicuspid valve. And uh, there was a publication, I think two or three years ago in the heart journal, showing that in fact, if you look at the calcification in patients with bicuspid valve, but these patients are usually younger, you lose this predictive value of the calcification in these patients. So it means that if if I remember correctly, the cutoff value for the age was less than 51. You lose completely the predictive value of the calcification. So it, it underlines again that indeed aortic stenosis is a broad family. It's not an homogeneous disease. So I don't think you can apply in young patients at least. So this calcium scoring system in bicuspid valve to answer to your question. And I want to come back briefly on the women versus the men. There was a very nice publication of the Mayo Clinic, uh, I think two, three years ago again, showing that for the same degree of severity in uh, women, you have much more fibrotic stenosis than calcified stenosis. And this has been also demonstrated by the same group. If you apply the criteria that Rosenek applied to this population, the predictive value disappeared in women. So it means that we have very, to, to be extremely prudent regarding the independent predictive value of calcification in this population in bicuspid valve and in women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, still another question from, from uh, Ignacio Iglesias also. Uh, he wanted to know, talking about uh, TAVI, if you think it's important nowadays having a CT to have a TE prior to TAVAR, do you think we need to still perform a TE study? Uh, well, it's a matter of discussion. I know we are doing both, as I told you, and I know that, for example, uh, uh, in Leiden, Victor Adegado is also doing both. I don't know many centers where they are doing only uh, TE. All the centers are, are actually uh, performing a CT at least. But we have the feeling that we have a better evaluation using both uh, because it's um, providing some complementary information, uh, especially regarding the anatomy of the valve. And it's also moving images with transfigural echo, I think. Uh, we can have also additional information from that. So we are doing both in our experience. And I know that in Leiden they are doing both too. I don't know what is your experience, um, Pepe? Well, in, in here in our hospital, uh, we don't do routinely CT for evaluation of the calcium. Uh, uh, I think that it's wise to do both. We do a CT scan in all patients, but we don't use routinely the score. So, uh, um, yeah. Oh, no, 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 I, I don't, I doesn't meant uh, that we, we are using the score in this population. What we are doing in this population, we are looking with the CT uh, 
at the amount of calcification, but mainly we are looking at the localization of the calcification. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In order to prevent, um, and not only at the level of the valve, but also at the level of the LVOT, because it seems to be extremely predictive of, um, of AV blocks, for example. Uh, yeah. So depending on, on the place, for example, if you have a lot of calcification at the level of the non-coronary cusp, you have more chance to have uh, 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 rhyth rhythmic problems. Yeah. But also for the prediction of, of PVL, of paravalvular leak, I think uh, the amount and the localization uh, is very important to predict this. And so this can improve, I think, your results regarding... Uh, uh, regarding the, the percentage of the prevalence of PVL, which is an important factor, as you know, in terms of uh, survival in this population. What about the, the correlation between the coronary artery disease and severe calcification? Do we have something about that? Of course. Of course, this is, this is something that we are very interested in. So if you look at, um, at the, um, the mechanism or the etiologies of uh, aortic valve cal degenerative aortic valve calcification and atherosclerosis, uh, we know that uh, first the risk factors are globally the same. So metabolic syndrome, obesity, hypertension, uh, IH, uh, male gender, and so on, diabetes, and, and so on. And so we uh, have been looking at patients having uh, these risk factors. And in fact, we observed that for the same risk factors, these risk factors are telling a different stories regarding aortic valve stenosis and coronary artery disease. What I meant by that, if you look at a patient that have a coronary artery disease with the same risk factors, and if you look at the aortic valve, so, if the patient at the time of coronary artery disease have no aortic valve disease, you have only after five years, 10% of the aortic valve sclerosis in this population. And among these patients, only 3% will develop a severe aortic stenosis after 10 years. This has been shown in the literature. What yeah. is really interesting is that if you look at the patients, you take the problem otherwise, same risk factors, you look at the patient having aortic valve sclerosis, which is quite frequent in our population because it's around 25 to 35% of the patients above 75 years old. What is really interesting is this population will develop a CAD with a cardiovascular event, death, myocardial infarction in 50% of the cases after five years. So therefore, and this has been really shown in, 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 a, in, a, in a publication, I think, more than five years ago. So having calcification at the level of the aortic valve predicts coronary artery disease events. So therefore, what we have been uh, uh, trying to, to do is to, to find some explanation for that. And the only explanation is that there may be some mechanical factors explaining that some patients will develop an aortic stenosis Yeah. The other way around, this means also that if you look and you can quantify the calcification level of the, of the aortic valve without any uh, severe stenosis, maybe this is a surrogate marker of atherosclerosis, in the development of, uh, of coronary artery disease. And therefore, actually, we are looking at a cohort from Leuven, where we are looking back to the echo that has been done 10 years ago with a good quality imaging, we are analyzing all the uh, echoes of these patients. It's a general population court. And we are looking at the aortic valve sclerosis and the amount of calcification in this population. We have a 10 year follow up regarding the, um, the, the uh, numbers of events. And I hope that next year we will be able to present you the results. But I think it will be a very, very powerful uh, surrogate marker for uh, coronary artery disease and events in this population. So I think that's why also ECHO could be really a powerful tool in the prevention of, uh, of I think, coronary heart disease just by looking at the, the amount of calcification. Thank you very much, Bernard. I, I wanted to, to know um, 
uh, that's for sure that before Tavar we have to look at the distribution of, of calcium. But uh, do you think the distribution of calcium more in the annulus, more in the leaflets, uh, has any importance uh, on pro progression of the disease in, in, in less severe aortic stenosis or even in the, in the risk of atherosclerosis or, or something like that? Do, are you looking at the distribution or by now you're just looking at the, at the amount of calcium in the bowel? We look at both, but mainly, in, in, of course, in the field of research. But I think, um, yeah, both are, are important. Uh, and, well, regarding the progression of aortic stenosis, it's, it's known, well, there are some data from uh, the group of Pawade, uh, so the group of Pibaro in, uh, in, uh, in Laval, showing that clearly, so the amount of calcification is predictor, power predictor of the evolution of the aortic stenosis. So for sure, this is also, the, the amount is for sure something very important. The localization, I think it's probably much more important uh, regarding uh, indeed patients in, uh, in who you plan, for example, uh, in whom you plan uh, a tavern uh, for the reasons that we, we discussed before. And uh, it's very interesting to, know, to, to see that indeed the localization can be extremely heterogeneous too. And this is also something that we look together with the group of Indieberg, so Mark Dweck, uh, for example. Uh, so they use a specific, a specific marker, so the uh, fluoride uh, that uh, can detect apparently so the uh, development of the osteoblastic phenomenon before any uh, appearance of the calcification and it can predict so the occurrence of calcification one year before and so this is also something that could be interesting to follow and also to test some interventions and uh, what is also uh, intriguing in these findings is that in fact, we try also to link uh, so the injury to the development of calcification in, in these valves and in order to be able to intervene at the more appropriate moment. So we need to better understand so the mechanism. And there are some, some mechanisms that are quite obvious. For example, if you take radiotherapy, we know that after, let's say, 24 hours, there are some uh, osteogenic phenomenon that are activated and uh, so this could be of course one way to intervene and other models they state that inflammation is the primum movens in, of this calcification so maybe if you decrease inflammation for example with high dose of statins maybe you can also inhibate the progression of calcification but the localization, to answer to your question, if you look at the, the, the localization of the calcification, it's very difficult to predict where it will occur, except if you use the uh, fluoride. But this has been shown only in one group, so we are also working on that actually uh, in an experimental model. And uh, we want to link the inflammation and the development of of this mechanism of osteoblastic mechanism in order to, to work on both, to inhibate this and to, uh, to avoid to have the development of aortic stenosis with huge calcifications. So I think it's really a very exciting topic, uh, but there are still some, some links that we, we are missing. And which is really frustrating is that the later stage, so when the, uh, the valve is heavily calcified, you have almost no more inflammation. And if you look at the uh, publication of this group, so the FDG is not helpful because there is no difference in terms of inflammation. Only the fluoride, so the osteogenic factor, are present. So still there are some things that we, we don't understand. And this is confirmed by some, so it's not the default of the technique because we, we have been looking at also the expression of inflammation in this later stage of calcification in aortic stenosis, we don't find any inflammation anymore. So it means that we have in to intervene before. Uh, so, and, and maybe then I will be able to answer to your questions. So, so the, the localization is maybe also important, uh, but 
up to now, I, I cannot. <laughs> but amount for sure. Perfect. Perfect. I think we have another question, um, uh, a little bit linked to what we have been discussing. Uh, is aortic uh, calcium score a good method to appraise the evolution of an asymptomatic patient with non-severe aortic stenosis? Do you think we're at that point? Well, I, I'm not relying on single numbers. So I have to be honest. So I don't like that. So I, I prone really to be to have an integrative approach. So it can be helpful sometimes, but uh, I think it's important to keep an integrative approach, taking into account not only the, I think the severity of the stenosis, but also the calcium, but also the clinical status, of course. Here we are, we are talking about asymptomatic patients, but also eventually biomarker and the myocardial damage. We, we, to, we try to integrate everything before, uh, before also taking any, any decision for these kind of patients. So okay. but maybe this could be, if we can do that with ECHO, it means that these patients maybe are patients with highly calcified stenosis should be followed up more, more frequently. Um, Bernard, we, are, we have a couple of more minutes, but I wonder, I want to go in a personal question that I have. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have uh, two patients with the same amount of calcification, same risk factors, but during the years, during the follow-up, one is developing a severe stenosis and another remains as a mild stenosis. Why do you think that the, the speed of, of the evolution of the calcification is different? What are the main factors? Same age, same? So I come back to, to the, the mechanical factors. I think this is also something that we are trying to, to, uh, to study. Uh, and, and we are working actually with engineers in order to look at the shear stress, not only at the level of the aorta, which has been done already, especially in bicuspid valves, uh, but also in degenerative valve. And we look actually at the shear stress level of the, uh, of the leaflets. So this is one option. Another is that if we compare the degenerative phenomenon that will lead to, to aortic stenosis, to atherosclerosis, you can imagine that you can have some hemorrhagic plaques that can rupture, and this can also happen within the valves and lead to the, I think, to the events and the fact that uh, suddenly the valves will, uh, will be, uh, of course, more stenotic and give more symptoms. Sometimes it's maybe also related to other factors like hemodynamic factors. And um, I think in this kind of patients, I, I would love to have some information about also the micro damage, uh, the occurrence of atrial fibrillation, which are of course extravalvular factors that can also intervene in the evolution of the patient. Okay, Koba, uh, do you have a last question? Yes, I would like to, to know if uh, you're also looking to uh, blood biomarkers uh, because there are some groups and, and studies going on trying to correlate uh, the degree of calcification and, uh, with uh, uh, biomarkers. Uh, that would be something also very appealing uh, from a clinical point of view to be able to just uh, assess as we do with BNP or, or some other biomarkers and to try to, to evaluate the, the, the risk of calcification or the rate of calcification. Are you looking at, at that uh, too or just focus on, on imaging? Yeah, no, no, no. We, uh, we have also been looking at that. We have also tried to measure different potential marker, uh, biomarker. And up till now, it has been quite disappointing. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, in, in atherosclerosis, I have to say. So, uh, actually, we are concentrating on, on the mechanistic approach, on the imaging approach. Uh, and, and, of course, as you, we have a biobank, so mm -hmm. we, we wait a little bit that other groups should maybe do the work, and then we will test it. Um, so we keep all the sample vo blood volumes, but uh, we don't test systematically for all the, these markers. As I mentioned, so maybe interleukin can also be interesting in the early stage. Maybe it's another one at the later stage. So 
And the problem is that uh, if you put all the aortic stenosis in the same bag, you, you probably will fail because it's an heterogeneous disease. And, and, and for sure, I think we should separate the bicuspid valve from degenerative valve disease. Uh, but so to answer clearly, so actually we keep that on hold. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, Bernard, I think it's uh, quarter to three. It's time to close. And before I give you the word to the final words and then to uh, Koba, uh, thank you for this last uh, email chat uh, before uh, summer. Uh, for me, it was very interesting and I learned a lot. No doubt that um, we have a lot of uh, research to do. In fact, I got a few ideas while you were talking that we can immediately try to test. And thank you for joining us uh, in this chat. Koba? Uh, well, thank you so much. I agree with Pepe. Uh, this is a very, very uh, interesting uh, topic and uh, I also learned so much and I think we have to look at the calcium from another point of view and, and maybe change uh, a little bit uh, the way we do our, our reports and the way we take a look at the calcium, at least from a clinical point of view, uh, just uh, take a more close look at the, at the calcium uh, of, the, of the aortic valve. So thank you so much and, and I'll give you the word to, to close the session. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation again. It was really a pleasure and very interactive and uh, it's a fantastic family. So congratulations for that. Thank you, Bernard. Bye then. Bye. Bye, Bye to all. Bye-bye.